They were based at the Pakistan Cholera Research Lab. Part of the problem that you had was the standard of care for extreme dehydration was saline that needed to be provided intravenously. It was expensive, it required the help of a nurse or a physician, and was, was difficult to provide in low resource, uh, low infrastructure set. Oral rehydration uh, solution, which then became part of oral rehydration therapy, helped change all that. Uh, today it is credited with saving more than 50 million lives in the 20th century alone. And the Lancet has hailed it as potentially the most important medical advance of the 20th century. Deaths from diarrheal diseases globally have declined more than 80% since 1980, uh, in, in great part because of oral rehydration therapy. Uh, today's roundtable is meant to uh, mark the 50 years that have passed since David and Richard's initial work. We will discuss what has transpired over that 50 years to, to disseminate that work and uh, spread an idea that work globally, which does not always happen. Uh, whether or not that approach can be applied to some of the health challenges that are facing Bangladesh uh, and other lower income countries today, like non-communicable diseases, like other uh, health threats that are now confronting those nations. Um, and I'm thrilled to have this opportunity. It's a great honor for me. I had the opportunity as part of a, a book I recently wrote to interview David and to talk to uh, or correspond with Richard subsequently. I'm so pleased to have them here. Um, you have their biographies before you, so I'm not gonna go over the distinguished career that they've had. Uh, Richard is the, to my immediate right, is the senior lecturer in the Department of Global Health and uh, Population at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. David is the, uh, currently the Professor Emeritus at the Center for Immunology and Microbial Diseases at Albany Medical College. The dehydration, when you pinch the skin, it remains up, it doesn't come back. These are basic clinical signs which we use to transform oral rehydration from hospital laboratory testing facilities to the home where the mother would be treating her child hopefully early in the course of time. Having begun uh, feeding the child the oral solution, and this was the original WHO oral light containing 90 milligrams of sodium, uh, a very good solution. Uh, so she's taking some given by her father. Next slide. Now she's getting a little more alert and she's holding onto her father's hand to make sure that it keeps coming. Now she's waking up to her environment. Next slide. And here we see her at the beginning and then after treatment. This is the ultimate goal, not to give oral therapy at the very onset of diarrhea before dehydration, when children are taking it, in this case, by spoonfuls, and prevent the type of dehydration we saw in the earlier slides. And this approach is what has literally, as of the latest um, UNICEF figures, decimated that is reduced to 10% of the original 5 million deaths per year. The latest figures, uh, last year it was 720,000, and this year it's targeted to reach uh, 500,000, which would be a true decimation. Next slide. In this final slide, I summarize the benefits of ORT. First of all, it reduced severe malnutrition called marasmus, because the previous treatments, including at Johns Hopkins and Bangladesh, was when a child had diarrhea, you practice what was taught in medical colleges at that time, starvation therapy. They thought that if you gave anything by mouth, it made the diarrhea worse. And they didn't know that in the presence of glucose or some amino acids or other sugars, you could, even during diarrhea, they could absorb it. So that reduced um, malnutrition to such an extent that in countries I visited, including notably Jordan and Costa Rica, where the malnutrition board was right next to the diarrhea ward, after several years, the malnutrition boards in those two countries were closed. But in many uh, countries uh, I visited as a WHO or PAHO consultant, I would go in the ward and the little children were in straitjackets, literally. They couldn't move around because they pull out the IVs. And, and in, in these straitjackets, sometimes they would vomit and aspirate and die of aspiration pneumonia. And very often, the IVs would become dislodged, and I have photographs with dozens of wounds from IVs, and the kids look like I have post-traumatic post stress syndrome. So a lot of this IV harm can be um, also obvious. In addition, by giving oral therapy an effective treatment, uh, one helps 
uh, to prevent use of inappropriate and ineffective other therapies. Uh, emergency rooms in developing countries, and there would be a line of 200 mothers holding infants with diarrhea in the waiting room. And it took eight hours for a doctor to see them. During that eight hours, if they weren't dehydrated at the beginning, they were dehydrated <laughs> sometimes severely by the end. I'm going to uh, uh, look at the whole notion of how do you take this observation and scale it up, both locally and globally, or from one to many. Uh, it seems obvious that people would want to take this on, but discovery does not equal implementation. Uh, in the early days, we tried to actually, we were very enthusiastic, uh, to get uh, pharma or Coca-Cola distributors or people who made matches or, or sandals or what have you to distribute this, but we couldn't find uh, much enthusiasm. This was then picked up by Jim Grant, uh, who was head of UNICEF, who developed a program, and his colleagues developed something called GOBI, Growth Monitoring, G, O, Oral Dehydration Therapy, B, Breastfeeding, and I, uh, Immunization. And so there were these international movements that saw this as a very positive thing, including USAID, who sponsored a number of major uh, 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 meetings and so on that brought people together. Uh, and after all, the experience uh, in the agricultural community was that it takes about 15 years for an innovation to become widely uh, widely accepted. Now, one of the problems, of course, with any international organization is they kind of want to do it their way. And so WHO wanted everybody to use their method. They, was, they were having packets, and they said, we want these packets to be for 1,000 cc's and so on. Here's one of these kind of packets. This is for 500, and I'll get into that. But ultimately, the acceptance of this is really has to be done nationally or locally. You can have all of the global uh, movements you want, but the actual uh, implementation has to come where the problem is. Um, one of these that I was very involved in is uh, with a uh, NGO in Bangladesh, now actually the world's largest NGO, it's called BRAC, B-R-A-C, and it's actually also been rated number one. Now I'm a little biased, I'm on the board of BRAC USA, but <laughs> we'll consider that. And the uh, it's a pro-poor, pro-women NGO. Uh, the favorite quote of the director, Sir Fosley Abbott, is small is beautiful, but big is necessary. So they were into scaling up. And they developed this method where they would use a three-finger pinch of salt and a handful of sugar in 500 cc's, which they showed women how to reach 500 cc's. And over a 10-year period, they uh, literally uh, trained women in their home, not in the clinic, uh, 12 million mothers. And Bangladesh today has the lowest, uh, one of the lowest uh, death rates from diarrhea and the highest use rate for ORT. Actually, uh, we wrote this in a book called The Simple Solution. Uh, which sort of documents this whole uh, issue. And the method of teaching the mothers uh, was very, very effective from a management point of view, so that 98% of the women learned how to make this. And it became almost part of the folk culture. So you can go to, you can go to uh, villages in Bangladesh 10 years, 15 years after the mother was taught, and the children will know how to do this. They'll know this method. So, What's, you know, one could say, well, where did the folk wisdom for chicken soup and colds come from? Probably a similar approach <laughs> was used. Uh, finding the right actors and programs to implement is as important as the technology itself. Uh, and uh, WHO did get involved in, in training programs for doctors to convince them that this was important. Uh, but there are, I think, very important lessons from the BRAC program. You have to have an institutional vision. You've got to you got to decide, I want to scale this up. And in scaling up, you got to keep things as simple as possible. You have to train people, uh, and you have to uh, get mothers and people in the community involved. As I say, finding the right actors is really important. As David had noted, and others have noted, diarrhea deaths have fallen, of which ORT, I'm sure, has played a role, as has immunization and a number of different things. But it's now finding other uses uh, in nursing homes. The elderly often get dehydrated uh, uh, because they lose their ability to uh, to feel dehydration. ORT is affected. ORT, it turns out, uh, is very important in the Ebola outbreak because diarrhea is a major killer. In 19 in 2007, uh, there was a 
uh, a cholera outbreak in DACA, and about 43,000 people were admitted to the institution that we were at. And uh, using a combination of treatments, uh, not one person of that 43,000 died of diarrheal disease. But I can tell you that if the same thing happened in the Mecca in Boston, or in Washington, <coughs> and so on, it would implode the system. Because in DACA, the parents were involved in the treatment. Nobody can treat uh, patients coming in at 1,000 today. So you've got to, you've got to transmit that knowledge and get them involved in treatment. We don't do that. We separate the parents from the children and so on. We professionalize. But in the process of doing it, I believe we don't uh, achieve uh, what we could achieve. I was very heartened the other day. Uh, I was talking to a, a recent doctoral student. He says, oh, RT, that's, that's really big in the, in the uh, e economics community. I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> really? Evidently, I'm no economist, but Paul Romer, who, won, who was a co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, in, 19, in 2018, uses ORT as a model for pointing out how new ideas and the transmission of, of new ideas can influence economic growth. That is, ideas are non-rival. Uh, they're not limited in distribution. And ORT, once you know how to do it, uh, it's not limited by uh, cost. It's not limited by availability. And so he uses this as a model for how to transmit ideas. And lastly, I'll finish with a, a well-known quote from uh, Albert Einstein, who said, everything should be as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler. <laughs> so, you know, we've been very privileged to be able to get it on, on the ground floor of development and to see something through a 50-year lens is, uh, is a rare privilege. And so uh, I think we're both fortunate.